number one show in the country is uh, Marcus Welby, and the number two show in the country is All in the Family. The number three show is Flip Wilson, and the number four show is Mannix. Now, I'm working on a show now to put on the air next week uh, that will combine all four ingredients. It's a story about a bigoted black brain surgeon who carries a gun. It's no good. It's got to be cottage cheese, egg, meat, water. That's it. Uh, it has about four days, you walk around, cottage cheese, egg, <laughs> water. I'm not a man. I'm a cottage cheese, egg, water animal. I saw, I saw Tony Fields the other day. Tony the... Fields. Uh, she threw away her bra. Isn't that wild? <laughs> it's like watching a mudslide walk around. <laughs> Tony Fields joined Women's Lib. Tony Fields, she's a, she's, that's right, she wants to be Playboy in the middle. She could be right now, Miss September, October, November, December. But no. well, what about Tony? No, she, well, she opened at the uh, Now Girl, she did a really nice show, but she was talking about the Stillman diet. Oh, the di yeah. And she said that she, uh, well, she took eight glasses of water a day yeah. for two weeks, and she said at the end of two weeks, she lost 12 pounds yeah. when her bladder fell out. Yeah. Has anybody ever come to you prior to the time they were ever divorced, I mean, if they were married and they didn't like the wife they were with, and they came to you and they said, would you find me somebody else? Oh, I have that quite often, but I tell them they have to think it over or go through the divorce first. I don't take them. But I have an attorney the other day who wants me to get him somebody for his wife because he don't want to pay alimony any longer. He said, this is tough. <laughs> Have you, have you ever had somebody then, Claire, that you put together and then later on for one reason or another they weren't happy with what it was and they came back to you and demanded a refund? Oh, yes. We have that quite often. Oh, they're not all. I haven't satisfied everyone. There was a German fellow he's squawking for because he claims his wife put one over on him. And I said, how? Well, I said, well, you know, Anna, you went with her a long time and you know you made a little love to her, yeah, you yeah. know. And I said, well, well, what's wrong? He said, she's a, she fooled me. I said, why? He said, well, she's got a wooden foot. Well, I said, didn't you ex do it through in court? You have to understand that or look at it? You know, he said, she always had her shoes on. <laughs> Was he starting to get slivers in his ankle? I don't know. Do you exercise daily? Do you have yes, a special I, diet? Yes, I do swim every day and I have a sauna bath and exercise practically all the day. Every time I'm in the bathtub, I do that. Just my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Counting the husbands. The other day, I went to see, for the third time, Stanley Kubrick's 2001. And in the film, the spacecraft carrying the astronauts to outer space is operated by a computer, and the computer's called HAL. A HAL reads lips, uh, he reads material, he can sing, he can talk, and he's intelligent, which means he's almost human. Because uh, if he weren't too intelligent, the chances are he would be human. And the machine is trying to destroy the astronauts. And just at the time when it looked like the astronaut would overcome the machine, the projector broke down. So we had to take a break. And during the intermission, I saw a very weird sight. I saw 40 people lined up very quietly, waiting to be fed by a Coke machine. And it suddenly occurred to me that our lives are really being literally taken over by machines. I mean, for example, we pay $3,000 for a machine to drive around in, but it doesn't move unless you get constant transfusion at 38 cents a gallon from another little machine. And when you're driving your big machine in the street and you want to park it, you can't park it unless you feed a dime every hour to a little machine on the sidewalk. <laughs> now, if you don't get that dime into that little machine, it sticks out a little red tongue saying it's been violated. <laughs> And that little red signal attracts another machine that's black and white and big with a red signal on it. And that big black white machine drives over to your machine and finds you $15 for not putting a dime into that little machine. <laughs> I'll show you how smart the little machine is. If it's not working, it won't tell you. It'll still take the dime. I mean, it doesn't stick out a little yellow tongue to say that it's not working. And so that the big black and white machine won't be attracted by that. What you have to do is you have to leave it a note. And while you're writing the note, the pen malfunctions. Now, you cannot leave that little machine alone on the street for an hour. But if you should pass out from the frustration, you could lie there all day long. Now, it occurs to me that with machines and computers taking over our lives the way that they have been, as people, we've got to learn to communicate better with one another. Because as human beings, because as human beings, 
Because as human beings, because as human beings, <laughs> When you brought out your uh, contract, uh, Fabian, at 18 years of age, did you do it because you felt that you really shouldn't have been where you were? In other words, you felt insecure in your own talents? Or? No, not at all. Uh, well, if you really want to get into it, I, I felt I was involved. Uh, there was a personal situation with the people that were handling me, uh, which I'd rather not get into. And uh, that's the main reason I did it, not because of any talent that I thought I didn't have. Well, when you were really making it big and the girls were, were swarming around you and everybody was interested in Fabian, did you fear that it would end or did you never think about it ending? No, I knew it would end. I just knew it would end someday. I don't, even though at that young age I knew it had to come to an end. So uh, when I decided to let it all go and embark on a whole different way of life, uh, somebody must have been looking over me, I don't know. Uh, I felt I made the right move. If anything happens today, I'll be very grateful. All I know is that uh, once, I was, when you're that young and uh, you're almost thrown into a situation like that, you want to settle in your own head, well, what do you really want to do? And what I'm doing now is what I really want to do. Were there, uh, when, you, when you first started to make it, Mm. Were the things that you did for your family and friends that you had always wanted to be able to do? Did I do them? Yes. Uh, I did the best I could, yes. When you were making all that money? Yeah, I, I did, yeah. Well, when you decided to stop, mm -hmm. were you afraid that perhaps you couldn't continue to do things yes, for your family and friends? very much so. Because after you lost your husband, was there a p period of time when you were grieving that you felt hostility towards this country? Of course, I'm human. Uh, my husband was taken away from me. My uh, children's father was taken away from them. I was very hostile. I um, admit that there were periods in my life where I was filled with hatred. But I looked around me and I realized that I could not function uh, as a human being that way, nor could I let myself feel that way and hurt my children and hurt others. And Medgar would not have wanted it that way. Was there a period also when the children sensed your hostility or did they feel their own individual hostility? Well, I don't know. I'm sure they must have sensed mine and they felt their own at the same time. But uh, the point is that you move away from that. You don't let those things hold you back from what you have to do. You don't let them hold you back from participating, finding new avenues of moving and bringing about change understanding, and perhaps even love. How should my wife go about potty training my son? Uh, it's often helpful to uh, directly reward him. Now, many people consider this a bribe, but uh, when he succeeds in doing what she wants him to do, uh, then uh, a sucker or uh, some candy or uh, certainly verbal praise in every situation yeah, goes a long ways toward giving him a reason for doing what you want him to do. Oh, you we... Know? We try to reward him with M&Ms. Yes, that's, that's the standard tool. <laughs> yeah, but I gotta tell you, you know, he comes in and he sits on the little potty and we applaud and we cheer and we bring in the neighbors and say, hey, look what he's doing. And then we yes. give him a bunch of M&Ms and we can't get him to do that. But the other day, my wife had to go to a, uh, the department store and she was looking at a bookcase and she went into the restroom and took my little son along with her naturally and when a woman came out of the stall he started to applaud her. <laughs> he in time invents some serum to save the kids but he dies at the end of the film and a really terrible piece of symbolism he dies sort of spread eagle like he's out on a cross and I would suggest that Chuck Heston take this still photograph and send it to Warner Brothers, who made this film, and sign it on the bottom, I died for your sins. <laughs> I saw The Omega Man. I don't want to talk about no. it because I reviewed it a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> He's trying to tell me something. No, no, no. <laughs> but with, uh, with Omega Man and with some of the films that you see around now, there is such a deep involvement in violence and relationships between males and females has disintegrated to the point where there's really no human relationship. It's just... Uh, I think you're right. I think uh, violence is an increasing preoccupation of, uh, of our time. I think uh, 
Of course, man is a, a carnivorous territorial mammal, and violence has always been uh, something that uh, is as ingrained in his nature as the, uh, the knee-jerk reflex. Do you really believe that? Yes, I do. Don't you think, Chuck, that violence could be educated out of man? This is a, a very comforting concept, but uh, I can't believe it, it's true. Well, supposedly, the strongest drive within man is a drive for self-preservation, right? Mm -hmm. Yet during World War II, the Japanese were able to educate their kamikaze pilots to the belief that self-destruction was not important. And so they killed themselves, because yeah. thinking they were going to the yeah. happy land of the rising sun. And therefore? Well, couldn't the same approach be made with any civilization that you could educate almost any attitude out of man? For a while, I've been trying to find a movie that I could recommend to you, but in the meantime, let me tell you about Jacqueline Suzanne's The Love Machine. It's playing at Grauman's Chinese Theater, where a lot of people are walking out in the middle of it or leaving their footprints. Uh, in the uh, novel, as you know, it probably had dubious literary value, but at least your imagination could help flesh out these shallow characters and give them some substance. But when these people are blown up and put on a large screen, they become even shallower. All the men are prone to be ambitious, and all the women are ambitious to be prone. <laughs> Is there something that you would like to have seen your husband do if he had not become mayor of the city of Los Angeles? Because his time is so you know, rationed that he probably isn't with his family and with you as much as he could be. Is there something that you would have liked to have seen him do? You know, John, I don't think I'd like to have him do anything except what he really wants to do. I think that's the most important thing in a man's life. What is his... Uh... <laughs> He's going to answer that for himself. Mary Yorty, thank you so much for coming back. <laughs> I wanted to get a look at you because I've been hearing about all these cracks that you make about me behind my back. And then, uh, well, look at I wouldn't make them behind your back if you were here in the city. I mean. well, but, but, uh, you, when you came on, you turned your back right on the camera on my show. I'd have been fired if I did that. The director out there was raising cane, asked me if I wanted to take over the show. And I, and I turned my back on the you camera. You had your own show. It was canceled. <laughs> Now, this is kind of a, a personal question, but uh, it's probably a question that haunts all parents and maybe parents of people who are political leaders and part of the establishment. We've seen difficulty with Sergeant Shriver's son and, and the Teddy Kennedy's son and just Unra had difficulty with his son. Have you in any way ever had difficulties with your son? I mean, not that are irreparable, but the kind of difficulties that put you at perhaps philosophical loggerheads where he would disagree with your father's positions on some things and vice versa? Well, John, he certainly doesn't agree with his dad on everything. Uh, For Jan a while, he didn't agree on anything. That seems to have changed. <laughs> well, how did, you, how did you get that to change? Oh, with patience, because uh, all young people go through different uh, periods uh, where they're influenced. He, he had one professor of whom he was very fond, who was very much to the left and had a great influence on him. Has and, your son, uh, excuse me, Mayor, has your son had any influence on you in any way? I mean, has your son altered any of your opinions or attitudes? Well, it, it's been very helpful to me to have a son who's uh, part of the generation that uh, we have to understand. And uh, he helps me interpret them. Yes, he's done that quite often. And he interprets me to them, too, within the limited range in which he can do it. <laughs> That's when these things were going on, the, the difficulties uh, when they, your husband and your son would sit down and talk about their differences. Whose side would you take? Now, over here on Channel 7, you have eyewitness news. You remember when the promotions came out for Joseph Benty? He had his father's eyes and his mother's nose, and they want him back. Um, <laughs> now, over here on uh, Channel 2, we have uh, Jerry Dunphy, or The Well Jerry Show. And the reason I call it The Well Jerry Show is because if you watch it, whatever uh, Gil Stratton or Bill Keen start their segments, or anybody in the news, they always look over to the right, and then they look back this way and they say, Well Jerry in sports today, Well Jerry in weather today, and my suggestion is, 
To make the show a lot more interesting, they should hire Tom Snyder for NBC, and they could call it the Well, Tom and Jerry Show. <laughs> Well, uh, John. The new television season is well on its way, and here to talk about it is a highly respected and nationally known television critic for The Hollywood Reporter, Sue Cameron. Sue, welcome to the show. Why is it that a man of Jimmy Stewart's talents and stature and a girl like Shirley MacLaine would pick those kinds of things to do on television? Money. <laughs> Pick uh, the third uh, worst show on the air. The third worst show on the air. <laughs> well, I would have to say it's a fight between the DA with Robert Conrad. So bad. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I really sound like a downer, but I can't help it. The shows are terrible. And the one up that upsets me more than Jimmy Stewart is Funny Face. Now, I know that that show is an ex a uh, success. I can say that I know why it's a success, but I can also say I'm not going to watch it because I think it's terrible. Sandy Duncan is darling. They put it in a time slot on CBS with a lead-in of All in the Family, so it can't fail, followed by Dick Van Dyke. And the people are going to watch her. A producer, um, the producer of Columbo said to me as I was violently screaming one day, wow, the scripts are terrible, how can this be? He said, don't you realize that if you have the right time slot, the right promotion, and the right star, only if the scripts are absolutely the worst in the world will the people not watch it. When you look at a show then like uh, Funny Face with a delightful girl like Sandy Duncan, and when the executives, more importantly, look at that show, don't you think it will someday dawn upon them that perhaps, instead of spending great sums of money on well-known names in films that they would hire creative people to develop concepts rather than looking for stars. That's what you hope for. Describe the new television season. Drek. Uh, his being on the show has nothing to do with the fact that I happen to be his father. He just is the greatest two-year-old golfer in the world. Christopher, how old are you? Two. That's a good boy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, sweetheart, hit the ball. Wow. Is that fantastic? Slow motion, sweetheart. Yeah. That a boy. Okay. Okay, let me see you putt, sweetheart. You don't want to putt? Okay, what I'm going to let you do is I have the ball. You want the other ball? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Blow the audience a kiss, sweetheart. That is it. Okay, I'm going to let you say goodbye. Say, shake Warren's hand because you beat him, sweetheart. The other, <laughs> the other hand. Shake it with the other hand. <laughs> okay, there you go. There you go. Warren, thank you very, thank very you. much. Uh, Giselle, thank you for coming by. Doctor, thank you very much. Once again, the doctor's book is Things Your Mother Never Told You, and I want to thank the panel again. And thank you so much. And Christopher, you're an absolute angel. Say goodbye, sweetheart. Bye. Bye.